The Ecology Part 3 notes are on communities. Communities are populations that are made up of different species that all live together in the same area and therefore interact with each other. The niche concept or niche concept, I've heard it uh, both ways by different scientists, so either way you want to pronounce it is fine, says that each species plays a unique role within its community due to its habitat and interactions with other species. An organism's ecological niche is essentially its job or ecological role that it plays within its particular community. It includes all the biotic factors that it uses, as well as any abiotic resources that it uses as well. So it's going to be the sum of all of the resources that it is using within its particular environment. This is different than a habitat. A habitat is simply the environment in which an organism lives. So if we think about an ecological niche as being more like its job, its job within its particular ecosystem, whereas its habitat is more just like its physical address. Where does it live? Interactions between species in a community are called interspecific interactions, not to be confused with intraspecific interactions that we learned about in part two. Remember, those were within the same species. These are going to be between species. Inter means between. And they can be classified according to their effect, as shown in the table below. We are going to learn about all of these different types of relationships in this section of notes. So if we look at the table over here, um, the effect is written on the right. In competition, both species involved will have an overall negative effect. So it is said to be negative, negative. One species is going to be on one side of the slash mark and the other species effect is on the other side. In mutualism, they're both going to benefit. So it's positive, positive. In commensalism, one species is going to benefit and the other species is neutral. So it's not going to be harmed, um, but it's also not going to benefit. And then predation, herbivory, parasitism, and pathogenicity all involve a positive negative effect. So one species will benefit and the second species will be harmed. We'll start with competition. Remember, competition will be a negative-negative relationship. In the sense of competition, we have two or more species that are competing for the same set of resources. This will automatically reduce the amount of, of that particular resource um, that is available to one species to the other. So one species essentially will outcompete the other species, but they both will have to compete with each other for this. So typically in the case of competition, they are both going to experience some sort of decline. Examples of competition include if you had barnacles that uh, were different species that were growing within the same intertidal community, they'd be competing for space and food on the same rocky shore. Other examples include uh, different species of ivy in this picture that are climbing up this tree. They are going to compete with each other for access to light. And I'm sure you can think of a lot of other examples as well, um, like two carnivores, for example, competing for the same um, meal, for example. The competitive exclusion principle describes how two species um, cannot survive indefinitely together if they have identical niches. And so this is where we're going to talk about the negative negative experience that they each will um, experience during competition. In the 1930s, Georgie Goss investigated the competition between two different species of paramecians. Remember that paramecians are unicellular protists that live in pond water, typically. 
When Georgie Goss cultured them separately in two different environments, they both thrived. But when he put them together in the same environment, um, they both had reduced numbers. So both of them did experience a population decline. However, one experienced this decline much more drastically. So again, it is a negative negative effect, but one is going to be outcompeted by the other one. In this graph, you can see that. So the top graph shows one species and the bottom graph shows the other species. When cultured separately, this species thrives. When cultured separately, the other species also thrives. But when mixed together, you can see that this species does experience a decline in overall population growth and size versus this one experiences a decline that's much more drastic. This is known as the competitive exclusion principle. This shows the same experiment, however, um, all on one graph. So here's one of the species um, growing separately, shown in purple, a dashed line. Here's the dashed line of the other species growing separately. Um, they both uh, did well, but when mixed together, these are the solid lines, you can see that the purple species did experience a decline, and so did the species that's graphed in black. The result is there's actually going to be two different niches that we talk about. First, we'll talk about the fundamental niche. The fundamental niche is going to be if an organism could theoretically use all of the resources, if there was no competition, if it was growing under completely ideal conditions, this would be the niche that is, it is able to occupy. That's known as the fundamental niche. The realized niche, however, is what it actually uses. And of course, this is going to be due to competition with other species that are present with it. Sorry, going back. Um, so again, two different niches. Fundamental niche means theoretically, if resources were ideal and unlimited, this is the resources it could use. But the realized niche is what the population will actually use, typically due to competition. Here's a picture showing that. So on the right up here, you can see this brown species of barnacle, and it shows you its fundamental niche. So without any competition, it can technically use all this area on this rocky uh, shore. But in the presence of this other species of barnacle, its fundamental ditch, or niche sorry, gets drastically reduced um, into its realized niche. So therefore, it's really only going to occupy this area because we have this other barnacle um, that is occupying part of that niche as well. Here shows them both graphed together on the same image. So again, the brown barnacle has a very large fundamental niche, but in the presence of the blue barnacle, it's not going to use very much of it. So its realized niche is much smaller than its fundamental niche. When we look at the blue barnacle, it's using its entire fundamental niche as its realized niche. Some organisms are going to have defense mechanisms to help them cope with competition. So one thing we've been talking about throughout this class and bio honors class is that all organisms have certain things that they need um, in order to grow and survive. These things are called primary metabolites. Organisms will make primary metabolites because they have to. They are essential for growth. These are going to be things like carbohydrates, proteins, DNA, things like that, um, lipids. But some living organisms also produce a different type of metabolite that's called a secondary metabolite. These are going to be other things which are not essential to life, but instead they're going to have different functions. Good examples of secondary metabolites include antibiotics and allelopathic agents, which we'll talk about on the next couple slides. 
Antibiotics are going to be substances that are secreted by microorganisms in order to kill other microorganisms when they are competing with them. And so it's trying to prevent the growth or stop the growth of other microorganisms within its area. Again, this is due to competition. So an example is in the fungus genus Penicillium, Penicillium fungi will secrete an antibiotic that's called penicillin. You might have heard of penicillin before. This is actually a common antibiotic that uh, we get from this particular fungus, and we take it for specific bacterial infections. However, in nature, um, this fungus will produce this in order to be able to um, kill off bacteria that comes near it when food is scarce for the fungus. That way it has less competition for resource. And so in lab, we can test this out. For example, we can take these little discs and we soak them um, in antibiotic. And you can see that when we put them down in the dish that's full of bacteria, when other bacteria try to come near it, it can't, right? It's gonna kill all the bacteria that's around it. Um, because of the antibiotic that's soaking within that particular disc. Allelopathic agents are things that are secreted by plants um, in the soil in order to stop the growth of plants that would normally try to grow around them. And this is one of the things that helps leads to the uniform distribution that plants often have in nature. The example shown here is the eastern black walnut tree. It's going to release a chemical into the soil um, from its roots called juglone. And other species can't tolerate juglone, and therefore they have a hard time growing near this particular species of tree. So you can see that there's really no other trees or shrubs around it. There are many different types of tests that we can do to test to see if there is interspecific competition actually occurring. Um, one method that we'll practice uh, in this unit is called quadrat sampling, um, and it's going to involve the chi-squared test of independence or the chi-squared test of association, same thing. And so essentially when you do this type of chi-squared test, you will be trying to figure out are these two species associated with each other or are they completely independent of each other? Do they have a relationship or do they not have a relationship? Competitive exclusion um, may prevent the two species from growing together. Um, so therefore, because of this, they may occur in quadrants less often if they do have an association than they would if they didn't have any type of association together. But this type of test does not prove necessarily um, that competition is the association that they are having together. There are other types of associations as well. Um, could be predator-prey, could be mutualistic. It really depends um, on the situation. So this type of test would only tell us if they have an association with each other or not. But again, it does not confirm the type of association that they have. There are other tests that you could do that would provide stronger evidence towards if it in fact was due to competition between the two species. We could perform field manipulation tests. In a field man manipulation test, you could remove one of the two species from the quadrats and therefore you can see if it will now increase without the presence of the other species, increase in population size. If it does, there was likely competition between those two particular species that was keeping the population sizes down when they were together. We could also do this in lab, right? We're under controlled conditions. We could grow the species both together and separate and see how this affects their population growth. And so um, this is very similar to the experiment that we looked at earlier by Georgie Goss with the paramecium. Moving on to herbivory, which is positive negative. Herbivory is going to be where an herbivore or a primary consumer feeds on a producer. 
Um, I'm sure you could think of lots of examples of this. In these pictures, I have limpets, um, which are a single shelled organism with a soft bodied organism that lives inside. They're kind of snail ish, but different. Um, and they feed on algae, which are producers. So herbivores don't only feed on plants, um, they feed on any, or they can potentially feed on any photosynthetic organism. Other examples would be any type of grazer, like a cow. Um, they have flat teeth to help them be able to eat grass. Same with zebras or giraffes, which eat leaves on trees. So lots of examples. But the animal is always going to be the one that benefits. The consumer will benefit. And then, of course, the producer is harmed because it's being eaten. Here's another couple examples. We have an aphid here, which is a very small insect. I know it doesn't look that small in this picture, but it is quite small. Um, and they have these really long tubular mouth parts that pierce into the stem of a plant and they'll suck out essentially the phloem sap that's gonna be present inside of it. The phloem sap is where all the sugars are um, for the plant. So more on that later this year. Here down here shows a beetle and they have jaw-like mouth parts that allow for them to bite and chew and eat uh, a leaf, for example. Predation is positive, negative. Um, the consumer or predator is going to be eating another consumer, which is going to be the prey. In this picture, there's a starfish eating a bivalve. A bivalve is any um, two-shelled, double-shelled organism, like a clam, like a mussel, like a scallop, for example. And so you can see that feeding relationship happening right here. Obviously, this organism, the prey, is being harmed. Um, and the consumer, the starfish in this case, is benefiting. Other examples would be carnivores eating their prey, like a lion eating an antelope or a hyena um, feeding off of a zebra, something like that. Sometimes um, these types of predator, prey, or even herbivorous relationships may involve a keystone species. Remember, a keystone species is going to be a species who um, has a huge impact on its particular community, even though um, there may not be all that many of them within that particular e ecosystem. It doesn't have to be the most abundant organism. It just has to be the most impactful organism. Removal of a keystone species will completely change the dynamics of the ecosystem. It essentially turns it into something very different. Keystone species will prevent species at lower trophic levels from completely taking over major resources that are needed by other types of organisms. So they are incredibly important. Elephants are a good example of an herbivorous keystone species. In the African grasslands, elephants stop the grasslands from being converted into a forest or a shrubland. They do this because they essentially can weed out trees. They can knock over trees. They can eat um, at critical growth points along their branches, which stop the trees from getting too big or too tall. Um, if the trees were to get too big or too tall, then they would form a big canopy in which case they would block the light and kill the grasses. And so we don't want that to happen because a lot of organisms that live in the grassland depend on the grassland um, for food, for um, shelter, for, for lots of different resources. These trees also rely on elephants for seed dispersal. So the elephants will carry the seeds to other places and allow for some amount of trees to grow um, in the ecosystem. However, they just stop the trees from getting too big and completely taking over. A classic example that you'll almost see in every textbook is gonna be the sea star. 
The sea star is a really essential keystone species. And one of the reasons it's a keystone species is because it eats mussels. It's a very good predator of mussels. We actually have a huge mussel problem here in California. And due to a recent decline um, in starfish within our particular area, we actually have way too many mussel mouths that are overgrowing. And so when you go walk along the shores, the rocks of the beaches around us, you're going to see lots and lots and lots of mussels. The problem with mussels is they prevent other macro invertebrates, which are um, macro means big, invertebrate means no backbone. So a mussel is a macro invertebrate. Um, a starfish is a macro invertebrate. They don't have a backbone, but they're big enough to see with the naked eye, essentially, is what that means. Um, but what mussels do is they completely take over the intertidal zone. And so they take away resources and space and food um, from other macro invertebrates. We need the sea stars to keep them in check because if they're not in check, the ecosystem quickly gets taken over by mussels and it loses that really good diversity. And so we see that a lot. So here shows when the sea star is present, diverse intertidal community. When the sea star is absent, the intertidal community becomes dominated by mussels. Um, and here shows that in graph form. So when the sea star is present, you can see lots of different types of species are present, very diverse ecosystem. But when the sea star is removed, a lot of other macro invertebrates will die out because the mussels will completely take over. Another really good example is the sea otter. The sea otter is a keystone species for a kelp forest. Um, this is because they eat the urchins. When sea otters eat sea urchins, it helps to keep the urchin population in check. That's important because what urchins like to eat is kelp. So urchins actually eat down here on the holdfast, which is kind of like, kind of like their root system um, for the seaweed or algae. And so it's going to eat at these critical points that keep the um, kelp anchored in place. So therefore, the kelp is going to float away and it's not going to be there anymore. Well, a lot of organisms depend on kelp as their food source and for shelter. And so without the kelp, look how many species are lost. All these grayed out species um, will likely die. And so you get a way less diverse um, ecosystem. It's no longer a kelp forest. It now is called an urchin barren. So I'm going to show you, this is a silly video, um, of sea otters eating um, the urchins. But what I want you to see is the, how, the urchin, how the urchins actually eat the kelp. It's pretty interesting. So I'm going to play this video now. In today's episode, we will be looking into the mesmerizing phenomenon of top-down trophic cascade, focusing on the case of otters and their ecosystem. Oh, where'd he go? Mm. Mm. Ah, I'm beating you! Oh, no. <laughs> the otters have been an endangered species ever since their fur became a prized possession, as it is the densest, and thus the warmest, in the animal kingdom. Humans hunted them almost to extinction, which affected not only the otter population, but also their whole ecosystem. The trophic cascade of which they are a part was altered. Due to the low number of otters, the urchin population dramatically increased, since the otters were no longer consuming these echinoderms. Mm, the spikes are the best. Mm -hmm. In turn, the urchins feed on the kelp that grows at the bottom of the oceans. Because kelp can grow up to a foot every day, they soon create extensive kelp forests, 
which serve as nursery homes for juvenile fish. Kelp grows on holdfast to attach to hard substrates. Without it, the gas bladders will allow it to flow to the surface. Once this kelp is no longer attached, the current will bring it to the coast, where it will be encountered by annoyed tourists trying to enjoy a nice vacation at the beach. An army of urchins is able to eat the holdfasts of multiple kelps, creating massive clearings called urchin barrens. They leave nothing behind. This type of traffic cascade is called top-down control because it begins with the top predator and affects every level there. There are many types of animals and plants that have defense mechanisms in place um, to allow them to hopefully evade predators. So let's take a look at some of these adaptations that they have. Animals may have what's called cryptic coloration, which essentially just means camouflage. So you can see there's some camouflaged organisms here, very hard to see them, therefore they can hide against uh, predators. Warning coloration, they're usually going to be brightly colored, and so this is a warning signal like, don't eat me, I'm poisonous, something like that. And then mimicry, where they can actually look like other types of organisms. And so there'll be pictures of this coming up on a different slide. Plants also have defense mechanisms to protect them from predators. Some of them are going to have toxic chemicals that they typically store within their vacuole. This can cause them to taste bad, and then the predator quickly learns not to eat them um, because they don't taste good. Oops, sorry, going back. And then some plants are going to have thorns, and so cacti or rose bushes, those are good examples um, of thorny plants. And so because they have so many thorns, they typically don't have a lot of predators. Some herbivores have developed um, adaptations that allow for them to actually consume the toxic plants um, without having any sort of complications for themselves. So they're basically almost immune to it. Um, and this actually leads to plant herbivore specificity, where that means there's actually only a few types of herbivores, the ones that are um, adapted to being able to eat that particular plant. Those are the only ones that will actually eat that particular plant. Um, an example is in milkweed plants, um, they produce toxins, but there are milkweed aphids. Remember, those are those little tiny insects that have the tubular piercing mouth parts that go into the plant stem and suck out the phloem sap. Um, but they can completely tolerate the milkweed toxin. And so um, they can still feed on the milkweed, whereas other types of organisms cannot necessarily do that. And they actually even allow for these toxins to build up within their bodies, and it makes them toxic now to predators as well. And so nobody wants to eat the aphids because they have the toxin. So this allows for the aphids to be even more efficient um, at being a, an herbivore on this particular plant species. Okay, so look at this toad right here. What type of defense does it have? Hopefully, you said cryptic coloration. And then how about this leafy sea dragon? Well, it's kind of questionable. It actually um, could be mimicry. Like right now, it's you kind of see it looks like kelp uh, or something like that. But if the background was in a kelp forest, then it could also be cryptic coloration. So there can be an overlap between more than one type of defense mechanism. What about this one? Warning coloration. Don't eat me. I'm brightly colored. I'm pretty, so I'm poisonous. And then here's a really good example of mimicry. So here's a snake, but this is actually the larva um, of a specific type of moth and it looks like a snake face. 
Not only that, but it can actually like weave back and forth and make hissing sounds like a snake. So this is a really good example of mimicry. This is another mimicry example. This moth looks like owl eyes. So in the dark, when other predators are trying to hunt for food, they're not going to mess with this moth because they're going to think it's an owl. And owls are very effective predators, so nothing would want to try and eat it. And then snakes that look like other types of snakes um, is another really good example of mimicry. So we have this coral snake, which is actually known to be incredibly poisonous, very, very venomous snake. And then we have this king snake, which is actually harmless. It doesn't have any venom. But the king snake mimics the coral snake. And so because of that, predators that would normally stay away from the coral snake will also stay away from the king snake. So having coral snakes around kind of helps to protect the king snakes because they could be easily confused with each other. Um, but if you are a hiker, then you need to watch out for these types of things. So you should always know what types of snakes or other types of harmful organisms are in your area um, and know what to look for. So there's actually a riddle. I always grew up with this riddle. It was when red touches yellow, it will kill a fellow. So that means when the red stripes and the yellow stripes touch each other, that's the venomous snake. So that's the coral snake. So here, red and yellow are touching. This snake is definitely venomous. But here you can see red does not touch the yellow. You've got black um, touching the yellow and black touching the red. So red and yellow don't touch each other. Therefore, it's not poisonous. I had never heard this one growing up, but red and black, venom lack. So either way, like you, you need to know what's out there and around you to be safe. Parasitism. Parasitism is a positive negative relationship where the parasite uh, is benefiting um, and it feeds or lives off of a different species. That's called the host species. The host species will be harmed. So that means it's going to be taking away something um, from the host species that the host species needs. So positive, negative. An example here shows a tapeworm um, in the intestines of another animal. So humans can get tapeworms, um, cows can get tapeworms, lots of organisms can get tapeworms. And the tapeworm lives off of this organism, it takes away important nutrients that would normally be absorbed by the intestines so that that organism has access to it. Now the organism, uh, the host, has less nutrients available to it. And it can actually take away so many nutrients that it can cause a lot of harm to that organism. Um, here's another example, ticks. If you hike, you should definitely watch out for ticks. So here shows a deer tick that's, uh, you know, in the ears of this particular um, deer. But if you take your dogs out or you go out, you should always check yourself for ticks because they are incredible parasites they bury themselves in you and then they essentially like suck on your blood um, and they can actually cause diseases because of this um, so they can cause harm in a variety of ways another good parasite would be like a mosquito um, mosquitoes suck your blood and so they cause harm to a host organism Pathogenicity is also positive, negative, and this is going to involve a pathogen. A pathogen is a disease-causing organism. So the pathogen is going to live um, inside or on another species, which is called the host, and it's going to cause disease specifically in the host. So this is a little different from parasitism. Um, an example here shows the potato blight fungus, which affects potato plants. Um, so you can see this potato plant has a fungus, and the fungus is living off of the potato plant, and the potato is definitely being harmed because it has a disease. Another example would be a bacterial infection in a human. You know, if you get strep throat, that's caused by a bacteria, um, so that is pathogenicity. The pathogen is using you as a host, so it's benefiting, and then you're being harmed because you're sick. 
Mutualism, positive, positive. Both species are benefiting. The relationship is mutualistic. Um, so again, these are organisms who live together for the benefit of both of them. A good example is going to be rhizobium, um, which rhizobium is a bacteria that is associated with a specific family of plants called legumes. Um, legumes are going to be um, like pea plants, for example, or green bean plants. Peanuts are a legume. So it's a big family of plants, but um, they all belong to the legume family. Um, but in the roots of these legume plants, there are going to be these nodules. And inside of these nodules are where the bacteria rhizobium live. Rhizobium is always associated with this type of plant. What rhizobium does is it helps take nitrogen from the air and fix it or turn it into a usable form of nitrogen for the plant. The plant needs access to nitrogen because it needs to build things that contain nitrogen, um, like proteins, like DNA, like ATP, for example. And so we need to be able to, you know, give that nitrogen in a usable form to the plant. So this is what the rhizobium gives to the plant, nitrogen. But in return, the plant gives these bacteria carbohydrates, so sugars from photosynthesis. And so back and forth, they share these things from each other. Mutualistic. And this is actually a specific IB example, so I would make sure you know it. These are actually both specific IB examples also, so I would make sure you are familiar with them. So two more examples of mutualism. Um, in a specific kind of fungi called mycorrhizal fungi, um, they actually grow into the roots of orchid plants. And these two types of organisms benefit each other. The fungus is going to help give carbohydrates to the orchid, especially in its early stages when it can't do enough photosynthesis for itself. It's going to need an excess supply of these carbohydrates, and the fungus will give those to um, the orchid plant. And then in return, the orchid is going to provide moisture, and then some food will be um, given back to the fungus, especially as the orchid gets bigger and gets better at photosynthesis. Uh, in coral, another example is in coral, there's going to be um, photosynthetic algae that are called zooxanthellae, and they live in association with the coral. So here's like the cells of the coral, and you can see the zooxanthellae inside. These are photosynthetic algae that are going to be able to photosynthesize and give carbohydrates to the coral. But how they get the carbon for photosynthesis is from the coral. So as the coral is doing cellular respiration, it releases carbon dioxide and gives it to the algae. The algae then takes that carbon dioxide, photosynthesizes it to make carbohydrates, and gives the carbs back to the coil or coral. So they associate with each other mutualistically that way, like a cycle. Um, the zooxanthellae, the algae, is also what is what gives coral its colors. Coral is known for being beautiful colors, but coral polyps themselves are actually clear in color. They get their color from the algae that associates with them. Commensalism is a positive and then neutral relationship. So one species is going to benefit, that's the host species, it's going to one or sorry, one species lives on another species. This species benefits. The host species does not benefit, but it also is not harmed. So it's basically just neutral for the host species. So here's an example: barnacles on a whale. Barnacles can cement themselves to all kinds of things, rocks, um, and whales, for example. When the barnacle is cemented to the whale, it has a place to live, place to stay, and the whale takes it through the water column so the barnacles can filter feed throughout the water column. But the whale doesn't get any benefit from the barnacles, but the barnacles don't take away or hurt the whale in any way either. Another example are epiphytes. 
Epiphytes are smaller plants that grow on top of larger plants, um, but they don't take away any resources from the plant itself. They're not parasitic. So here shows these epiphytes growing on this tree branch. It helps the epiphytes get better access to light, and then the tree branch just doesn't really gain anything, but it's also not being harmed. So it's a commensalistic relationship. Communities are going to be affected um, in regards to population sizes by both top-down and bottom-up limiting factors. We talked about this a little bit last unit as well. Um, typically, both will impact the community. However, one of them, either the top-down or bottom-up limiting factors, does tend to have a greater overall impact. Remember that bottom-up factors are going to put pressure on the lower trophic levels and it's going to impact the entire food chain or food web from the bottom up, right? So all trophic levels will be impacted starting with the ones on lower levels. It typically has a negative impact on all of the levels above it. So for example, if this plant is not getting any fertilizers, then the plant themselves are not going to grow as much and therefore you're going to have less snails, less herbivores that feed on the plants. If there's less snails, um, then the carnivores that eat the snails, the frogs, also decrease in population size. There's also not enough food for the foxes because all the other trophic levels have also diminished. So it tends to negatively impact every level um, above it. Versus top-down factors are pressures that are going to be applied by the higher trophic levels first. And they actually tend to have what's called an oscillating effect um, on the lower trophic levels. So, for example, if the fox population declines, so let's say disease kills a bunch of foxes or something like that. If there's not enough foxes, then they're not eating as many frogs, so now the frog population increases. Well, if there's a lot of frogs, then they're going to eat a lot more snails, so that's going to negatively impact the snail population. Well, with not as many snails eating the plants, the plant population increases. So again, it does tend to have this like oscillating effect, positive, negative, positive, negative, um, as you go down the trophic levels. And that's actually it for the part three notes.